everyone, I'm Wen Ting. I'm here to present my own personal project, uh, The Verlog Boy. I guess I'm actually the youngest presenter here. I'm currently an undergraduate student at uh, Penn, State, uh, Penn State University, and uh, I'm currently an intern at the uh, Unlock Devices. Uh, and uh, this project is probably like uh, not of much practical use, but uh, I had a great fun designing it, so I hope you will also enjoy this talk. Um, due to the limited time, I will not go into the details about the implementation of the actual Game Boy, but rather focusing on some more general information. Let's first take an overview of the project. Uh, the project has been divided into two parts. The first is the Verilog Boy Core, and second is Verilog Boy Handheld. The Verilog Boy Core is an RTL implementation of the Game Boy, mainly the CPU, the GPU, and the sound generation unit, uh, and also like a few other supporting peripherals. Currently, it's capable of running uh, many of the commercial Game Boy titles, uh, like Mario, or Legend of Zelda, or Pokemon, but it doesn't really mean it's an accurate implementation, because I said here, the CPU is accurate, but the PPU is not quite. Uh, it's currently working on the Panalog G1 and the Verilog Boy handheld, and the uh, Verilator based simulation is mainly used for debugging. The Verilog Boy handheld is an FPGA based handheld game, uh, console that's designed to run the Verilog Boy core, but surely one can uh, flash other bit streams and run there, for example, probably a chiptune player. Uh, there has been three revisions. Uh, this is the first revision, being buggy and doesn't really work. I hand soldered all these parts and doesn't really work out. I will go into the details of some designs later. Uh, before I go on and talk more about the details, I would like to share some stories about this project first. Uh, I started this project a little more than one year ago as my cross project for the Computer Engineering 275 Dig Digital Design Lab. Uh, I saw there would be a final project for that course, so I went to and asked my professor what we, would be the requirement for that uh, project, because I know if I'm going to do anything big, I really should like start at day one. Uh, and he replied that as long as it contains some sort of digital logic that I designed, it, it will be fine, because it's really like the introductory uh, course. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have seen a lot of people like trying to implement various type of uh, retro game consoles on PGA, especially the NES, very co popular. I thought it would be uh, pretty cool if I can do something just similar like this. I just picked the Game Boy. Uh, surely enough, there are like already some other people trying to do the same thing uh, on the GitHub. Some claim to work, some not really like incomplete, just live there. These incomplete uh, projects are like warnings for me. I really should not underestimate the time that required to uh, implement such things in FPGA. And uh, uh, given that it's, this is basically my first FPGA project, I really had no experience to begin with. Uh, so I decided to begin with some existing code. I took the, took the CPU from the Fighting Meerkats where they implement the buggy Game Boy, but their CPU is working. So I used their CPU and built my Game Boy on top of that. By the end of that course, uh, it was basically working. I demonstrated playing the Legend of Zelda uh, at the end of my presentation. Uh, that really should be the end of this project, but there is one thing still bothering me, because I took other CPU, I didn't really touch that, so I rewrote the CPU myself. Without deadline, it took a very long time due to my procrastination. Also, <laughs> at least for me, any project without any sort of hardware component is kind of boring. So that's why I took on challenge also designing some hardware, go with it. Uh, but then I encountered some issue with the MIPDSI screen. Uh, being afraid of, I will never be able to sort it out. So I switched to the panel logic for development, which turns out to be even more troublesome. But just finally, I'm able to just get everything nice and working again and here presenting that. Now let's talk more about details about the Game Boy system on the chip. Uh, the same architecture also applies to the Verlo Boy Core as well. It was originally designed by Sharp based on their SM80 series CPU core found in some microcontrollers. As it's similar to Intel 8080 and Xilog Z80, it's also 
uh, sometimes referred as the GBZ80. In the system on the chip, there are mainly two 8-bit parallel buses, one the main memory bus, another is the memory mapped I.O. bus, which is exclusive to the CPU. Uh, while two others are shared by the CPU, PPU, and the DMA, uh, when the PPU or DMA is accessing the memory, the CPU cannot access it. Uh, the most confusing part is like, there are many buses, but they use the same address space. So sometimes it's available to one peripheral, sometimes it's available to another peripheral, it's hard to sort out. And uh, also CPU, PPU, and PSG also have their own dedicated memory. So they don't have to occupy the bus all the time while they're running. Let's talk more about the CPU. It's an 8-bit CISC machine running at effectively one megahertz with 10 registers. Uh, the accumulator, BCD, are four general purpose registers. High and low combined together function as a pointer to a memory locations, and also stack pointer, programming counter, flags. Uh, the instruction length is from one byte to three bytes. Uh, usually the first byte is the opcode, followed by an optional 8-bit or 16-bit immediate value. If the first byte is 0xCB, then the second byte is treated as an opcode. Combined together, there are in total 511 opcodes possible, where, uh, inside of that, 500 being actually valid. Invalid instructions will just crash the processor. I have to point out that the opcode here merely means the first uh, byte of the instruction or second byte if it's 0xCB. For example, the register uh, transfer instructions, if I borrow the name from MIPS, it will be called as a R-type instruction. Uh, 01 is its uh, opcode, and then you have the next three by uh, bits being the RD and three bits being the RS. But here, like we say, LDBD and LDCE, rather than saying there are two instructions uh, with the same opcode 01, we're saying there are two instructions with different opcodes 0x24 and, four, uh, sorry, 42 and 4b. Well, uh, I'm not going to talk more details about the instruction sets due to limited time. You can find them online anyway. Uh, then it comes to the PPU, it's pixel processing unit. A PPU is what's rendering the image. It runs at four megahertz. It can push out pixels at most one pixel per clock. All drawable scenes are organized in eight by eight tiles. In some games, tiles are obvious, some are not. In the memory, back, uh, there are three layers, the background layer, foreground layer, and the sprite layer. The background layer is as large as 256 pixel by 256 pixels. By moving the display area, the display is smaller than that. You can move the display area around. Scrolling effect can be achieved by this. The foreground layer just works the same, but it's uh, limited to the screen size. The sprite layer is just movable objects, like you see uh, some, some characters can run on screen. These are implemented using the sprites. There can be at most 40 sprites. Many people previously attempt to implement the PPU on the FPGA has asked one question, uh, how it's possible, how it's even possible. Because uh, it can push out four megapixels per second, but the VRAM speed is really limited to two megabytes per second. If you do some calculation, we have one layer and another sprite. Uh, on top of that, it will require 2.5 megabytes of per second bandwidth, while the VRAM is not capable of doing that. Uh, I looked through some other people's code. In the FPGA boy, they just let the PPU and the memory all run at 33 megahertz, so there's no issue at all. Uh, on the Ver very Game Boy emulator, they just use dual port uh, VRAM and dual port OEM RAM, so they have a lot of bandwidth to work with. So how did Nintendo actually achieve that? The answer is the Nintendo didn't really achieve that. When such cases happen, they just pause the rendering fetch the data and then continues. <laughs> it's a boring answer, right? But yeah, this is what reverse engineer has uh, discovered. So I implement it the same way. Last, it's the programmable sound generator. The Game Boy has a four voice programmable sound generator. Two are square waves, uh, one are PCM, and one is a noise. The name is pretty much self-explanatory. All four channels have adjustable frequency, adjustable volume, can be uh, timed, turned off automatically. Some channels can also uh, sweep the volume and sweep the frequency automatically. 
Next topic is uh, Virtual Boy Handheld. It's a keychain sized handheld gaming console, uh, mainly designed to run the, run the Virtual Boy Core. Also, it probably could be a great platform to beginner, for beginners to play with the FPGA. Let's start with the PCB. Uh, the broad itself is a four layer design. Minimum trace width and uh, separation are four mils with the minimum hole diameter is 0.2 millimeter, which is the smallest you can get with uh, mechanical dr drilling because the laser drilling would be very expensive. Uh, right hand side here is a screenshot from the unfinished re revision 0 0.3 broad. As you can see, it's kind of dense here. Uh, the, this main biggest PGA part is the FPGA, it's a Spartan 6 FPGA. Next to it is the uh, 8 megabyte uh, pseudo SRAM. Then the Spy Flash up here is a PMIC, which uh, handles of the battery charging. Also, it will measure like how many uh, battery capacity is still remaining, providing three bulk regulator and uh, four linear regulators. Up here is the microcontroller, it's a STM32. It will take control of uh, initializing the PMIC, it will initialize the DAC, in initialize the LCD screen, it will also read from the SD card, uh, handling the FAT file system, handling the USB communication, so uh, the bitstream can be upgraded through the USB. These are things you really don't want to do on the FPGA. <laughs> And then left here, this is a DPI to DSI bridge to connect the screen. Up here, it's an audio DAC. Uh, then you come to the overall structure. Many people have asked me uh, why, why it's so small. It will be a horrible idea to actually play games on it. Uh, well, I guess though there are like many of the reasons I can say why a small handheld can be more favorable. For example, I can carry this all day around. But the main reason here is the screen. The, I was forced to make it so small. The original Game Boy have a 160 by 144 pixel screen. To get the pixel perfect display, you really want the screen res resolution to be uh, integer multiples of that. So it will be 320 by 288 or 480 by 433, things like that. It doesn't have to be exact, it can be slightly larger and then I can crop that. The only screen have such resolution and it is still in mass production is the screens from the smart watches. And so, yeah, they are small, the tiny 1.5 inch like this. Uh, so I basically designed that around of that screen. The drawback is like these screens only come with a MIPI DSI, which add to my trouble. In the current revision, the MIPI DSI is directly driven by the, uh, using the FPGA with a service running at 270 megabit per second. Uh, in the next revision, as you've already seen, I add a bridge chip. Uh, the reason is that I hope the interfacing to external logic, external devices can be as easy as possible on the FPGA. So uh, more people would be able to uh, write this uh, program for this platform uh, if it ever goes to mass production. Uh, directly drive, uh, driven MIPI DSI just seem to go against this. So. But anyway, I'm glad that I actually got it working before I move away to dedicated bridge chips. Currently, the keypads are directly taken from the Sega Dreamcast VMU. Uh, I need to investigate more about this in the future if I want to mass product this. Uh, up, up on the top are the I.O. ports, one USB, one 3.5 millimeter headphone jack, and one SD card slot. Yes, it has headphone jack. I'm not going to be creative on this. <laughs> <laughs> On the right hand side, there is a rotary encoder used to control the volume and the screen brightness, and also it functions as a power button. Uh, I really hope that it will be a dedicated power button on that, but I just run out of space. Uh, on the back, it's a big uh, user replaceable battery. Currently, I'm planning to use a BP6M battery from Nokia. Uh, not sure if there are more better choices, but so in Conclusion, uh, the handheld is still working progress, uh, but it's kind of working now, running some demo. I need to, still need to figure out for more like details. Another target I mentioned was uh, Panologic G1, what's that? 
uh, it was a startup company that set out to develop some FPGA-based sync clients and got some success, but unfortunately defunct since 2013. These sync clients used to be purchased by big companies in very big volumes, now becomes useless and can be purchased on eBay for like under 10 bucks each. The low price makes it very attractive pro uh, target for uh, hacking and repurposing. Specification-wise, uh, it's either a Spartan 3E or Spartan 6 FPGA, depending on the uh, generation and the revision. Some DDR memory, Ethernet, uh, video output, audio, and some USB host ports. I picked G1 as my current target. Cool, uh, sounds like a perfect device for running uh, this Ritual Gaming Console's course, right? What would be the challenge of porting the Verilog Boy core to such a device? One is a storage, another is the input. When I first prototyped the Verilog Boy on my Vertex 5 rod, it has huge block RAMs, and it has onboard parallel no flash. I can put uh, just the internal RAM all in the block RAM, put the game on the no flash. It also has tons of GPIOs. I can hook up any kind of controller so I want. But since are very different on the G1, uh, the onboard fla spy flash is mostly occupied by the bitstream, leaves me around 300 kilobytes for me to use. Uh, given the game, a typical Game Boy game size is around one megabyte to two megabytes, it's just not gonna to work. Uh, the only solution is going to put the load the game somewhere else externally, either from the Ethernet or the USB into some larger uh, onboard and volatile storage like DDR. Uh, but these things need to be sorted out. Uh, and also, the controller, there you cannot expect to find any GPIOs on some commercial products like this. I have to use a USB controller to just con control the game. Well, cool, Panologic has been reverse engineered and uh, there should be a lot of code I can just reference and uh, do my job on top of that. Well, yes, but actually no. <laughs> no one has ever touched the LPDDR on the panel logic. The Silenx MIG is uh, the go-to solution for interfacing DDR memory on Silenx FPGAs, but they support 16-bit DDR memory. The memory on that is 32-bit LPDDR memory. It doesn't support either. So, and no one has touched the USB controller on that. The USB hot controller isn't even fully EHCI compatible, and I really need a lightweight USB hot stack that would run on the on a small soft core. Since they're just getting tough for me. But anyway, I implement all of them. I modified the MIG to work with LPDDR, wrote the host controller driver for the that USB controller chip, port the U-Boots USB host uh, stack to the board, and all this, uh, and also implement a generic USB HID gamepad driver. All this USB related stuff is running on a, a Pico RISC 532 core on the FPGA. Now uh, they are all working. I can controller control the game with the USB controller and uh, load the game from USB stick. So as a conclusion, this is what I set out to do. The final presentation is really should be the end of that project, uh, but this is what I end up doing. <laughs> Consider them as my learning experience. Well, it's probably not just a wasting of my time. Uh, future plan, I really have no idea. Probably make it fully cycle compatible if it's even doable. Make some DIY kits of the Verlock Boy handheld so people could buy and play. Uh, but there are still a lot of issues to solve. But anyway, I learned a lot along the way and I'm willing to learn more. Also, I'm trying to help others who, who wish to learn. So thanks for listening. Yeah, it just seems like I have two minutes left, so I have some additional bonus information here. This is one bug I found using the Moon IGB test ROMs. Moon IGB is a Game Boy emulator, comes with a lot of test ROM to test the, the cycle accurate behavior of the, their emulator. One of the tests is called add SPE timing test. It tests the, the add SPE, this instruction, uh, which SP gets plus to the E, which is a eight bit immediate value and store back to, uh, the SP. It's a two byte instruction. The second byte is just the immediate value. And it should take exactly four cycles to ex execute. And uh, the read of the immediate value should happen as a second cycle. 
uh, this test just tests this behavior. Um, well, Verlo boy Cora failed this test at first, so, but I'm pretty sure my implementation is correct, uh, but why? I really need to see how they are testing that. It's complicated, but because the test is running inside of Game Boy, uh, it cannot use logic analyzer or things like that. It need to arrange different peripherals to test that. Here's how. It will put the add SPE instruction, such as the first byte is at the end of the work RAM, and the second byte is in the another piece of memory called OEM. Then it will start at DMA uh, transfer. You know, the DMA will occupy the bus, and that bus will be inaccessible for the CPU here. It let the DMA occupy the OEM bus, so CPU cannot access the second byte. So uh, it was then execute the instruction uh, at the second last cycle before the DMA ends. And then the second byte read what happened at exactly the last cycle of the DMA transfer, meaning the DMA is still occupying the bus, and then the CPU will not be able to read that byte. And then uh, if it managed to read the correct value, then task fails, means your CPU is not reading at the correct time. Uh, well, my at SP instruction is good, but almost everything else is wrong. My DMA start is two, one cycle too early, and uh, do the D DMA does not actually uh, occupy the bus correctly, and I didn't manage the memory map correctly, so yeah. Okay, so that's the end of it. Thanks. Any questions? Quentin, that was unbelievable for, for like <laughs> your first digital design project. <laughs> Absolutely unreal. Um, so yeah, one question I have is, is I understand with these emulators, yeah, they're very, very particular about the certain timing of, of the chips, right? But it, how did you get the information about the rest of the Game Boy system? So the CPU and then the PPU and the audio processor, what, what was the resource that you used for that? Um, well, it's actually kind of amazing. Like since the Game Boy was introduced in 1989, there are people actively trying to reverse that. And uh, just today, people are still trying to reverse engineer that. There are still some unknown things inside of that. Uh, for example, like last year, people just discovered the Game Boy actually that uh, pretty simple 8-bit Cisco core has a two-stage pipeline where they trying to do some clock glitch and only present the data at certain uh, nanoseconds and see what's the CPU's behavior, <laughs> doing crazy things like that. And they publish their uh, results online on, on some wikis, also some GitHub reports you can find. Just search Game Boy and you'll find many related resources. Wow. Okay, cool. Questions? Yeah. Do you have a battery in the console? Mm. Do you have a battery in the console? Uh, currently, this does not have one. Okay. Yeah. So uh, this audio codec you have, do you need an audio codec? Because you can just do PWM or sig Sigma Delta from a PGA, right? Yeah, because, uh, well, I guess it's I It's expensive don't part. Yeah, it's an expensive part, but I guess I just uh, there is still some room, so I throw it in. <laughs> not really. Uh, like pretty much too many reasons for that. So you, you have ARM controller on the board. Uh, what, what you use it for just loading the code? Or something? Yeah, basically. Yeah, because I, I said I want to like uh, ease the writing of RTL. There should be, uh, if anyone want to write RTL for this platform, there should be uh, as little as bring up code as possible. They should be able to just start encoding their uh, core logic, and everything should just be magically there. And the magic is done by the microcontroller. Very good. Anyone else? Yep. Uh, you mentioned this, the start of the project was, um, was because you needed it for a class. Right. Uh, did, did you get a good grade? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, my, my professor is kind of uh, completely shocked by this project. No one has done such things before. It's such a, uh, it's a, a sophomore level class. <laughs> it's really introduced to uh, digital logic and uh, other people are doing uh, like blinking LEDs. <laughs> it seems like that, so I got an A of course. <laughs> Yeah.
What's your favorite Game Boy game? <laughs> well, uh, personally, it's actually Pokemon. I just play it through many, many times. Uh, actually, I bought some later consoles like NDS, 3DS, and just for playing the Pokemon, I didn't really spend too much time on other titles. Yeah, also uh, another reason is like I'm not good at playing uh, other more control involved games. <laughs> yeah, so RPGs are fine for me. I'm, I'm hoping you get like another digital design class where you know you do the N64 or something. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> maybe next year. Cool. <laughs> All right, a round of applause again for Wenting, everyone. Thank you. Okay.